onto the thought, we say we have this image of the gates of heaven are opening. They're opening to for us to um, supplicate ourselves, to give ourselves an opportunity to uh, to ask for forgiveness, ask for a better year, ask for whatever. On uh, Yom Kippur, we say that the gates are closing. So we have that last opportunity to ask for forgiveness. Not so much forgiveness from us to God, but really, in some cases, it's from man to man. What we say on Kol Nidre is, all the transgressions we've had, God will forgive us, but not between man and man. During this time period, these days of awe, uh, we find many people who are uh, like a scale. They're out of balance. And they stay out of balance because they don't know how to get themselves in balance. And so during this time period, we try to look at ourselves and we try to get ourselves back into balance by looking within ourselves reflective of what's going uh, on within ourselves, self-reflection, and try to achieve this balance. Tonight's play is really about that. The year is supposed to be 1985. It could be 1995, it could be 2015, because it is that kind of a play that is, goes on through years and years. We are in the synagogue, much like this, and the congregation is in prayer during Yom Kippur. The Kol Nidre service, the evening service, then the morning service, and then the afternoon service and the Yilah, the, the concluding service. The people you're going to see each have a story to tell. Their stories are very poignant. Their stories are self-reflective. They talk to you because they're telling you their story. How they resolve the difficulties they have within themselves sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. But they're going to give you their story. So with that, leave that and enjoy. The gates are closing.
There's always a moment at the beginning when everything looks shiny and everything seems possible. When you start out right, make it all go slow before it gets away from me. She's wrong. I am still scared. I have to begin. There we go. A disciple once asked his Rebbe about Adam in the Garden of Eden. When Adam is eating the forbidden fruit, he hides himself in the garden. Why then does God call to him, Adam, where are you? Doesn't God know where Adam is? The Rebbe replies, God knows. God asks, where are you? Because Adam has lost himself. So long as Adam pretends that hiding is possible, he cannot begin to find his way. God asks, where are you, to awaken him, to bring him out of hiding. And so it is with us. We go along day to day, and suddenly, something sends us into hiding. Some pain, a failure, a glimpse at something dark and ugly within. We are afraid to see who we've become. We don't want to be seen. And that is the gift of Yom Kippur. Today is the day for you and me to look at ourselves, to come out of hiding, to face our mistakes, our regrets, and put them behind us. It offers us each the possibility of healing, to feel whole again. Our service tonight begins with Kol Nidra, the ancient formula which asks forgiveness for our broken vows, our unkept vows, and permits us to join together as one congregation in prayer. It permits us a new beginning. David will be in Harvard. 
The money's in the bank. If he gets in, he'll go to Harvard. Yeah, it's, it's a good life all in all, if not for the dream. Twice already this week. Every year. Summer ends, the, the kids go back to school. The dream, it comes again. My young Kipper dream. It's in, it's in the desert. Egyptian planes overhead, shooting. It really happened in 67, just like that. The whole unit was there. But in the dream, it's just up. One boy alone, lost, wandering in the desert, and these planes coming at him. He dies flat in the sand. There's, there's no cover. There's not a rock to hide behind, just sand and sun. I see him so clear. He's crying. In 67, we were attacked. Then our planes came. There was a dog fight, and suddenly all the planes disappeared. But in the dream, in the dream, it's just up. He's lying there. They keep, they keep shooting at him. He's crying. In the dream, our planes never come. Out of the depths I call to you. Hear me, Lord, hear me, and set me free. Who will hear my prayer? Is there a person anywhere who ever sins? Remember us that we may live, you who delights in life. Inscribe us in the book of life, for your sake. Grant lasting peace to Israel and all people, for you are the God of peace. I thought something will save me. 
One of the kids will get sick, or I'll get sick. I'll say I'm sick. I just couldn't think of another lie. I'm tired of lying. It's not something I do well. I do well with everyday things, like getting out of bed in the morning, and laundry, and pots in the sink, and clearing the table, and loading the groceries. I pretend there's this huge, strong hand in the middle of my back, and it's pushing me, and I get up some momentum. I go, don't think tired, don't think at all, just think, keep going. Left foot, right foot, do -si do Just keep going. Hand to the back, push. I don't recognize myself. Sometimes I'm holding Michael or Benji. They come into bed in the morning and the bed is packed full of this delicious flesh. For a moment, I just let go and I feel happy. But it won't last. It doesn't last. Jake thinks it's my mother. I'm still mourning my mother. How could I tell him? What would I tell him? I wish I had had an affair. At least between the lies and the secrets, there would have been some pleasure. If I told him, what would it change? I don't know what he'd do. It was so easy. I just said, I need to go check on my father for a few days. And Jake said, sure, go on, I can handle it here. My father thought the money was for my plane fare. He paid for my abortion and he never even knew. No one knew. I didn't tell anyone. It's the first time in my life I've done anything and I didn't tell anyone. I didn't want another baby. I didn't want to talk about it or think about it. I just wanted God to know. God, who giveth what you don't want, who taketh away what you do. Abino Marcanu, our father, our king. You and I are through. That full hot thing I had for you is done. I no longer expect from you, and you can no longer expect anything more from me. I'm tired. I don't want to play anymore. I just can't tell that to Jake. Our service tonight concludes with the mourners' cottage. All mourners, please rise. We rise as we remember our dead. Kadabi, Kadish, Shemay Rabbah, the Alma de Lawar Kote, the Amlik Malkute, the Ahkon, the Yomekon, the Kaye Kol Bai, Israel, the Agalab, the Mizman Kari, the Amu Amen. I thought of you a few weeks ago, found that old record you made, the Cantor Sings. I couldn't play it. To hear you singing would have been like raising the dead. So I sat there in the attic, holding that record, looking at it remembering. Your hair, that shock of white, how you let it go wild to look a little more like Einstein. I remember your hands. I used to watch them when you helped me prepare my bar mitzvah. I used to think, how vulnerable, how delicate. You had the hands of a chazan. Down to your fingers you were a chazan. I never even said, I love you. You were silly. So silly it was embarrassing. The maiden aunt always gushing, and that ridiculous girlish giggle in your 60s. Then nothing. Silence. Back then, we didn't know. Alzheimer's. By the end, just two random words mysteriously remained in you. Temporarily. Unexpectedly. Temporarily. Unexpectedly. Unexpectedly. Temporarily. No one to say cottage for you. I always thought when I made a big dub, I'd bring you over, we'd be partners. I thought you'd have kids, our kids would grow up next door, like we did. I never said cottage for you. It was not even a grave, a telegram. October 18, 1973, dove missing in action in Sinai. And now you're in my dreams. You're crying in my dreams. I lit the yard side candle for you, Mom, in the living room on the mantel. I knew you'd want it. But it hurts me. There's something mocking, cheerful with that flickering little light. I should remember, tell the kids, I don't want it. Don't do it on my account. No cheerful little light for me when I'm gone. 
I never wanted the pity of my classmates. Pity was hateful. I never even told them, but that's how I'm always introduced. Her mother's dead. When she was 10, cancer. I hated that. By dying, you somehow took over my identity. If you hadn't died, I could have been athletic, musical, something else. He was so little. I don't think he really remembers you. I was really his mother. When he gets up to say Kaddish for you, I get goosebumps because someone's walking on my grave. Is anyone listening last night? I asked Becky, am I boring? She said, no, it's them. They need to keep their distance. Everyone wants a seat in the fourth row. To see it all and feel protected. She's got a point. God and the people of Israel, they were lovers long ago, in the desert, warmed by the sun, bare feet in the sand, making love in the desert, God and Israel. But now, it's George and Martha. <clears throat> You tried to get me, I'll get you. Where were you when I needed you? Why did you walk out on me? Becky says, the rabbi's a marriage counselor, and God and the people, they're having a meeting after a long separation. God sits there aloof, and the people, they want, they don't want, they don't know what they want. They're angry, they're hungry, they're skeptical. They want to be the people of Israel but it's been so long, it doesn't feel like home anymore. You're an old god, they say, and sometimes you were boring. And when you weren't boring, you could be dangerous. And always, I'm caught in the middle. I want them to reconcile, but God, like the bridegroom, has his pride. God is shy, yes, shy. Doesn't come out in public much anymore. I'm supposed to speak for God somehow. The Torah reading today speaks of Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. They took each of them his censer and put fire therein and laid incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded. And there came forth fire from before the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. I don't understand this story. Why are they punished? Are they impure? Drunk? Perhaps they've come to overthrow their father, the high priest, or they're not enough at all. The text seems to say, you may only approach God as you are commanded, with the proper intent, with the proper offering, the proper time. Not every approach is acceptable. And when you approach God, you are in danger. Our God is multifaceted, creator, warrior, liberator, angry parent, patient teacher. I ask myself, which face of God will I encounter when I come with my offer? I cannot know. In part, this is our supplication on Yom Kippur. I will try to come with a pure heart, with the proper intent. Meet me with tenderness, enfold me with love. Please come, when I approach you, do not find my fire strange. You call this a holy day? Because you're fasting? You think that's what God wants? This is nothing. This is business as usual. You oppress your workers? You quarrel. You fight. The homeless in your city, you pretend you don't see them. You read the papers. You watch the news. You know what's going on. But do you help? Do you hold out your hand? Look at you, sitting here. All dressed up in your holiday clothes. Waving your malicious tongues. Straining for a morsel of gossip. Even in a synagogue even on Yom Kippur. 
Is this the fast that God has chosen? Is this the affliction of the soul? To sit here pretending remorse? No. This is the fast that God requires. Loosen the bonds of wickedness. Let the oppressed go free. Share your bread with the hungry. Clothe the naked man when you see him. Bring the homeless into your home. Then, then shall your light place forth like the dawn. Your, your suffering quickly, quickly shall be healed. Then, then when you call, the Lord will answer. answer. When you cry out, God will say, Here, Here I am. The thirst of your soul will be quenched. You shall be like a water garden, like a never failing spring. This is the promise of the Lord. When they come to me for the UJA, they don't understand. They figure, he's got money, he's, he's an Israeli. He should pay through the nose. What do they know? In my war in 67, we gave water to the enemy. We carried their wounded on our backs. Now it's another country. These Americans don't understand. They think life in Israel is hard. They think I came here for the money. A couple of years ago, we made a big donation. It was 25 years since my mother died. They put up a plaque with her name over there. I wonder what they used all the money for. You're a big giver, my father. I respect that. For years, you run this UJA, got their money for this building. You volunteer to be cantor for the holidays. It's impressive how you give, how you care. When it comes to me, though, you don't know me. I spit on her volunteer work, especially for the sisterhood. I said to her, sure, Ma, they're happy to have you for free. Make them pay you, Ma. Make them count you for the minion when they're dying. Why was I angry at her? For being a victim? Of course she never asked them to pay her. She just died feeling small. I made her feel small, not them. I didn't anticipate all the pregnant women. Kids, yes. I just hadn't thought about all the kids on the way. Sarah and Ben told me before I bought the house, they said, Joan, we want you nearby. It's a lovely town, but there are no singles here. Think about it. I thought about it. I make good money in the city. I'm throwing it away on rent. And I wanted to say to myself, finally, you bought a couch, a real couch. You bought real silver, service for eight. Buy a house, not some little apartment. Buy a house. There's no man in the wings, and if there is, he can find you in New Jersey. What'd you think all those years, Joan, that you'd meet Mr. Special after work at the 97th Street laundromat? Right. Dr. Terrific would be coming out of the bagel nosh Sunday morning, just as you were walking in, and you'd look at each other through the glass double doors, and what? I'll know when my love comes along. I'll know there and then. There and then. 10, 15 Sunday morning, right outside the bagel nosh. Right, so here I am, 48 years old, a homeowner in, homeowner in the suburbs, my mother. Joni, if you want to meet someone, be where the people are. Actually, she hasn't said that for three years. She's so frightened both her daughters are still unmarried, she can't talk about it. Her silence hurts me more than her nagging used to. Once she gave up, it was only a matter of time before I gave up. I got too tired, pushing myself pottery class, the ballet, the new school, the Y, the Minion, the park. Out, Joni, out, get out where the people are. It's crazy, what if some man had actually approached me in Central Park? What, I'd have invited him home for hot chocolate? Right. So here I am, 48 years old, homeowner in the, sub homeowner in the suburbs, shopping, decorating. Everything's so expensive and, and I want everything. At least once in my life, I should have everything. That first winter at the center, I went out and I bought the kids 20 blanket sleepers. The mothers had said, there's not enough heat. They kick off the blankets at night and that's why they've got colds all winter. So I went out and I bought those kids 20 blanket sleepers. I was, I was always buying them 
books, Dr. Seuss, Maurice Sendak, and, and hair ribbons, the rainbow kind, the little dolls with the outfits that come off, and trucks for the boys, little racing cars. Sexist. It all gave me so much pleasure. I saw how much I could do without. That drove my mother nuts. You run around in those ugly rubber boots and you spend all your money on welfare kids. Well, I didn't need leather boots, a new winter coat every year, oriental rugs and free, and my hair styled every three weeks at 30 bucks a clip. What I needed was to go buy 20 blanket sleepers, hair ribbons, rainbow hair ribbons. Mm, I just got harder. New kids, always cold always appealing. All the kids are our kids to save one's soul is to save the whole world. I gave up. The system will screw them. And the paycheck of one day parent director, it's nothing. So, here I am, homeowner in the suburbs, walk to the train, zip into the city, short ride on the subway, try not to look, put in my time, Home again for the 7 o'clock news. Like my mother always said, Joan, you can't save the whole world. Who knows? Maybe I'll meet someone on the train. <clears throat> the concluding morning prayers begin with he nay me. He nay me, here I am. The candor suffocates. Here I am, God, imperfect. Here I am, God, unworthy. I stand before you as a representative of these people. Do not condemn them for my sins, but hear my prayers and theirs. Hear us, forgive us, and bless us with life and peace. Life is funny. When I was Jonah's age and they first asked me to be camping for the holidays, it was easy. I had the voice. I knew the prayers. I was just a kid, but they needed a camper. In those days, they had no money to hire one. So I did it. I would sing and tremble. My kids, my guts, everything was in it. I never thought of it as work. I thought, oh, work? Work is something grown-ups do boring, and no one helped them. Everyone said, Murray, being a cantor is not a profession. It's old men do it. Or you volunteer for Yom Kippur. A cantor is not a profession. An engineer, that's a profession. From that you'll make a living. But a cousin, no. Now I see a profession wasn't what I needed. Now I see when I was in high school, I had this incredible voice. So the old cousin trained me to do parts of the service. I never had a moment like that. I just wanted to live in those moments, to stretch the mass. Such a different place. Not basketball, not television, not pulling some girl in the movies. It was a different world and I wanted to stay there. It was what I was meant to do, but I didn't know that. I thought to be an engineer, a professional, I have success in my hands, it's not so bad, but Every young kipper, this gets harder to do. Peel off the layers of schmutz. I feel sick. I think this year, I won't be able to do it. I'll open my mouth and I stand next to this shiny boy, the old cosmic train. I feel dirty. I tell myself, Mary, this is crazy. You don't lead a sinful life. You lead an ordinary life. Ordinary? But how do I cut through this dead skin? this thick, callous skin, to see if there's anything, something, light, quivering deep inside, something luminescent. Every year I take my hand and reach into my gut. I want to pull out something pure, an offering to God, to say, Mary Liebman is still alive. He's still alive down here. He's looking for you. But I reach inside and I'm scared. Is there anybody there? Hello in there? Is anybody home? Is anybody home? They blow the chauffeur and I think, is anybody home in there? The real me is getting smaller as I get older. The real me is getting little with a high-pitched voice. 
And how can a Chazan have a little high-pitched voice? And there's this other person who keeps getting bigger, who's taking over. He's in the driver's seat. He's the one who goes to the meetings and flies first class. The engineer, the consultant. He's the one who gives the secretaries all the work to do. He's the one, you know, goes out to lunch with the guys. Yeah, with the guys. He goes out to lunch with the guys. But the Murray, who's all the way inside, the Murray, a once a year part-time cousin, he has no one to talk to. There's no one to check up on him, like I used to do with my mother. I call in the morning, or go on the weekend, check up, see if she was still there. Did she die in her sleep? There's no one to check up on him. Once a year, I go looking for that Mary to see if he's still there. When we were little, my mother used to tell us about life before the war. Friday nights at the Shabbos table. I feel sleepy from the wine, put my head down on the tablecloth, white on white embroidery, with the shiny white kiddush cups and palas and bunches of grapes. I'd close my eyes and listen to the stories. Her mother, her bearded grandfather, stories of Seda with Santa Emmy, how they all laughed and her father did imitations. What her mother baked. I could see matzo balls bobbing in the soup with little golden pools of chicken pants, chicken fat dancing on the surface. When I closed my eyes, I could smell the men's rough jackets, the tobacco smoke. I could see the dark hair piled on the heads of the women, each with a cameo brooch pinned to the collar of her white lace blouse. I felt warm sitting at the shop's table with my mother's family, sleepy from the kiddush wine. I could block out the ending. On a good night, my mother blocked out the ending too. When I was in college, I saw a long day's journey into night. At the end, Catherine Hepburn, the other mother, has had her drug fix. She comes down wearing her wedding gown, talks about being a young girl in the convent. That was my mother on Friday night with the Shabbos candles talking herself back to Hungary in 1935. My father would suddenly reappear from the living room, breaking the magic. My brothers knew their cue. They'd jump up, clear the dishes. My father would help her up, lead her into the bedroom, not a word between them. Then he'd come back, carry me into my bed. In the middle of the night, I'd hear her whimpering. I imagined him beside her, not knowing what to do. Was it better to wake her to Brooklyn, 1968, or to stand with her family again and again in Auschwitz, 1944? When I was older, we didn't do that anymore, the Friday night table. She was afraid of what I'd ask. I wouldn't have, though. I couldn't. When she did try to talk about it, I didn't know if I blocked it out or never heard it or heard it and forgot it. Now I feel ashamed. Like she's told me a lot, but I've forgotten. If I ask now, she'll see I've forgotten. I'm ashamed to have forgotten. <clears throat> Even now, I don't want to hear it. Even now, in June, on my 23rd birthday, she asked me to dinner. No one else was there. She serves me with her hands shaking. Neither of us is eating. Pea soup, veal cutlets, mashed potatoes, it's all going from the pot, to the serving dish, to the plate, to the garbage. Sure enough, after she clears the apple strudel, when I was 23, she says, your age. I knew this part. When she was 23, they took her to Auschwitz. I knew that. She knew I knew that. When I was 23, she started again. They took us away, my parents, and me, and your father, and my grandparents. I knew all of that. My father escaped and he spent the war in hiding. And my brothers, and my sister, and her family, and they took us all, all of us. She kept saying that, and then she'd look at me meaningfully. She started again. They took all of us when I was 23. I 
I've never told any of you, but you should know, I want you to know, Emily, you're not my first daughter. Then I understood why two sons weren't enough for you, why you kept trying after three miscarriages, why you were still making babies past 40. You're not my first daughter. And then you cried great racking sobs, and I held you and rocked you as if only a daughter who had reached 23 could put her mouth to the wound and suck out some of the poison. Tell me, Mama, who am I named for? Thank <laughs> you. 
On Yom Kippur, when we hold nothing back, our prayers pass through the gates of heaven and are received. The shadows are long. The gates of prayer will soon be closed. The afternoon Torah reading for Yom Kippur enumerates all the forbidden sexual couplings. This seems strange. Why do we read this today? <clears throat> then and now, the Jewish people cohabit with many other cultures, cultures where virtually everything seems permissible. In view of this, a moral structure, a moral structure, which names our hidden fantasies and places them out of bounds, it performs an immeasurable service to the sanity of the individual and to the sanctity of family life. And the Lord told Moses to tell the people, None of you shall come near any of your own flesh to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. You shall, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's father. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. You shall not your father's nakedness. You shall not my sister's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness. My mother is naked. You shall not uncover the nakedness. You shall not uncover. You shall not nakedness. You shall not my father's nakedness. You shall not cover the nakedness. Uncover the nakedness. My brother's nakedness. You shall not. When we were growing up, we went everywhere together, Miriam and Aaron. Now we spend Yom Kippur together. One day, it's too much. I can't figure out if my father fools around. He does a lot of consulting in San Francisco. What goes on in the dark is private. Sometimes when I wake up in the morning, there's a woman in bed with me, and I call her Miriam. My heart stops. I feel afraid. Now it makes sense why she didn't want me touching her. The older you get, the more I wonder why you're still not married. Does Joseph fool around? He never brings anybody home. Is it my fault you're alone? Some new woman next to me, and by mistake, I call her Miriam. And she figures Miriam is some old girlfriend. My heart stops. I feel afraid. He has no idea. 
panic, stupid mistakes, how they shame you. 22 hours straight, I go lie down for 50 minutes, and Reuben buzzes me. Hey, you got three patients left, Liebman. Well, okay, I'll find a med student to do your work. I know your type. So I stand there in surgery, holding a retractor for him. Three hours, four hours, and he yells, can't you hold that still? Somebody get me a med student to hold this thing still. But there are tricks, little tricks you need to survive, like what to eat before surgery. Coke and trail mix. Gives you energy, but doesn't give you the runs. Coffee is murder. So is fruit juice. Coke and trail mix. But not just the nuts. That gives you gas. You need just the right combination to stand there for six hours every morning. When you, when you gotta go during surgery, somebody get me a med student. Liebman's gotta go potty. You would never believe this that your son, the surgeon, spends six hours every morning holding a retractor and praying he doesn't have to take a crap. No, what you, what you ask is, so what are your patients like? How do they relate to you? Like I'm God, Dad, like I'm God. Some are afraid of me. They shrink, hope I'll forget that they're there. Some flatter me, flirt with me. Some know I'm an intern, they treat me like dirt. They're so full of anger, as if their cancer was a poison, and if they, if they could just spit it out, they'd be cured. Then there's the bag lady. She came in finally when the cancer was growing outside her cheek, enormous. So they removed it, and she had this huge hole, this defect where her cheek used to be. So they swung over a flap of skin from her forehead to graft, but it didn't take. It turned purple and black. They had, to re re they had to remove it. And now she had two big defects. So they took a piece off her shoulder and swung it up to her cheek, but she rejected that flap too. So now she's got three big defects and still nothing to take care of the cheek. Meanwhile, she can't eat. It's five weeks. She's getting paler and weaker and frailer. She's my patient, right? So every morning, 5 a.m., my first stop of the day, I gotta go into her room, turn on her light, wake her up. I say, good morning, Mrs. Cheek. I gotta clean your cheek. And I get my dressings and my forceps and my scissors and my clamps and I pour the peroxide into the basin. I take off the old dressing and I start wiping away the crust and the pus and the saliva and the mucus and I pick away the scabs. I scrape the tissue till it bleeds a little, till what's left is a healthy pink. And all the while, the pain is agonizing for her. But she's silent. She's silent and dignified. And all the while, I keep repeating to myself, you're not going to vomit. You're not going to cry. When you're a surgeon, some first-year intern will do this for you. Five o'clock every morning, you're not going to vomit. You're not going to cry. This isn't your fault. It's not your fault. I slap on some gauze pads, and it's only 520. Make the rest of my rounds. Wolf down the trial mix and the coat. And I'm in surgery from 730 till 2. And I stand there, holding in my pee and my crap, and thinking about the air on my face and how it felt at 4 that morning, walking over to the hospital. Now it's still only October, and I'm a first year intern here till June. I think about Rosen, and I wonder what the air is like today, down at the shore. The sun has set. When we count three stars in the sky, we blow the shofar, and our service is ended. Now is the time to lift our prayers to heaven. Our Lord, our Lord, you are gracious and compassionate, patient, abounding in kindness and faithfulness, assuring love for a thousand generations, forgiving inequity, transgression, and sin, and granting pardon. Dove, 
I loved you. Forgive me that I'm not in the land, that I made it, that I'm alive. Duh, stop crying in my dreams. Rest in peace, Duh. Let me live in peace. How do I get on with my life? This should be the middle of my life, but it doesn't feel like that. It feels like I'm still at the beginning. How do people know what to pray for? Wouldn't be so terrible if I met somebody on the train. I need a blessing from Murray the Chazin. I'm not walking out of here feeling like shit. Once a year, Murray, I'll hold on to him this time. I won't let him go until he blesses me. When is it my turn? I'm sick of competing with the dead. I was the good little girl. I never complained. But it's finished. I have a right to say it's my turn. I'm alive. You have to bury the dead. If you found a wife, if you got married, I can let go. She'd be responsible. If I found him alive, wouldn't I be free? One more year. If I make it through this year, I'm home free. I just have to get through this year. Becky, I love you. Don't hurt me anymore. The gates are closing. The shofar will blow. It's over. What do you want? I want you to forgive me. I'm tired. I'm afraid of you. Jay, it's hard to ask for forgiveness. I need some way to come home. I wanted to die, and then I began to feel so small. Not life-size. It sounds crazy that I was so far away that I couldn't reach far enough to touch anyone. I couldn't have grown a baby inside of me then, and suddenly I had this terror that you would make me do it. I'm not like that. You know it. How do you think I feel? Couldn't you trust me? All year you pushed me away. I wanted to love you. To hold you. I know, and I'm sorry I hurt you. I know I hurt you. I couldn't be with you. What kind of marriage is it? When you're in pain, you hide from me. I'm here now, and I need you. I need you to forgive me. You think it's like magic? You think in a minute we just suddenly make everything all right? I think we can turn down a different road together. Jake, we love each other. I know you still love me. I love you. It's time. Everyone has a prayer. Everyone wants an answer. They're asking God. I'm just asking you. Yeah. <laughs>